Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this interview and workshop with Lisbeth Carolina Arias. This program was put together by our library's Making Space team. Making Space aims to confront bias and systemic barriers um, to inclusion in the STEM fields by presenting the experiences and perspectives of underrepresented groups in science and technology, including people of all identities and abilities. In doing so, we seek to inspire all members of the NC State to community to take on new skills, learn emerging tools, and be creative with technology. And today, I think we have the perfect guest to meet our goals. Lisbeth, thank you for joining us, and how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you for asking. Thank you for being here. You have an amazing story, and I'm going to let you tell it. But to give our audience a little bit of background, you were born in El Salvador. You immigrated to North Carolina at a young age. You graduated from the College of Textiles at NC State, where you studied fashion. And since then, you've worked all over the globe in the fashion industry. And now you have your own label called Descalza. Um, how would you describe the work that you're doing at the moment right now? Uh, so currently, at the moment, um, if you follow us on Instagram or any sort of social media, you'll notice that I've been giving a couple of sneak peeks in the past couple of days. Um, but we are about to launch um, our graduation stoles uh, on our website. Uh, we had our photo shoot a couple of weeks ago. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to, to release those. And then uh, we also are selling at our first uh, retail shop in downtown Raleigh. Um, so for the next few months, you'll be able to go to the store and physically buy our Descalza headband. So I'm excited. It's a good time. Nice. And your website will be in the chat for anybody who wants to check it out. Um, that's super awesome. We're going to wrap our way all the way around and get back to that. But I want to take it way, way, way back. Um, I read a couple places that your mother is a really good seamstress as well, really skilled. Where did she learn the craft and how did she pass it on to you? So my mom started sewing uh, way back like in El Salvador. She is one of 13. And so in our family, um, every child had like a specific task, right? And so my mom's chore was to um, basically sew all the clothing for her brothers and her sisters. Um, and that's something that she learned from her cousin. Um, in El Salvador, like, family lives on top of family, right? So like your uncles, your aunts, your tias, everybody is just right next, you know, right next door. And so my mom's cousin taught her. And then here, when we got to the United States, um, that was the first job that she had. She was a seamstress at a manufacturing plant um, in Sanford. And so um, just watching her so, you know, having our sewing machine at home, I really wanted to learn the trade. It's just something that I was very curious about. Um, and so she taught me a little bit, but then she got scared that I would injure myself and like sew through my fingers. Uh, so I actually learned a little bit more of it um, in school uh, back in like the seventh grade when you had to take home ed classes. Um, but now with the sky set, I guess I'm grown enough that she knows I'm not gonna sew through my finger that she, she teaches me these little like tricks on just making things a lot simpler, um, a lot more clean and very crisp. Um, so yeah, it's definitely been a journey with her. That's amazing. And can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up in North Carolina? It's uh, the story of immigrants is something that I like to talk about a lot. My father is also one of nine, so from a big Latin family. He grew <laughs> up mostly in Tijuana, and one day the cops came. My grandpa had a successful small business, and one day the cops came and said that he hadn't been paying his taxes, aka bribes. And so they took his cars and a lot of like the family valuables. And so after that, my grandfather said, you know, enough is enough. He had polio, so it's not like he could really defend himself. And that's when it wasn't the whole family at once either. My aunt, my oldest aunt went first. She got situated in Santa Cruz, California. And then slowly more brothers and sisters went until the youngest, like my dad, could go with his mom and his dad as well. And it was a journey, but it was for opportunity which I think a lot of our stories are. It's to, to give us a better chance so that we can talk on Zoom for work as opposed you know, to having to do some of the things they had to do growing up. And um, yeah, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so I was born in 91. Um, so 
a little bit of the history of El Salvador is at that moment they were just finishing up with their civil war and it was a really long civil war. Nobody ended up winning. It just killed the economy, killed, did a lot of bad things to our country. Um, and so my mom being there, she saw that it was going to be very tough for my brother and I to have a better life in there. And so she did what any mother would do was, you know, sacrificed everything, left everything that she knows, you know, being familiar with the country, having her family right there, knowing the language. She left all of that um, and brought me here. Uh, I was two years old. And so she said she carried me along the whole way. And I believe it because she has very strong arms. And so I could see out of fear she would never even put me down, um, just out of fear of what would happen. Um, so yeah, we came um, in July of 94 uh, to California, um, where my tia was already. And from there, we were, we were in California for about a week or so. And then uh, we took a plane and came all the way to North Carolina to a little town of Stanford because my dad was already here. Um, and so at that moment, like there was nothing in Stanford. I think they barely had a McDonald's. Um, but it was a perfect place uh, that my dad felt that that we, my brother and I, could be raised. Um, and so, yeah, they still live there to this day. I'm not too far, you know, um, right, 45 minutes away. But uh, over time, same thing happened. You know, uh, family, more family started coming over. Um, but still, like, the majority of the family is in Salvador. And so my mom and I try our best to go home and, you know, spend time with family over there and just, you know, keep keep both cultures alive, right? The one that's back home and the one that's here. And how did your mom's work tie it into El Salvadorian culture? Were you, a, was she able to work on traditional textiles when she got to North Carolina or was it more working on clothes that you were just wearing around the house? Yeah, she, so because of work, um, she wasn't really able to explore the things that she was passionate about and make the things that she wanted to make. So, you know, at the manufacturing plants, she was making table covers, umbrellas, random things, whatever, you know, um, the kinds of facility was making them do. But things that she would help me with, um, I remember uh, whenever I would do presentations um, in school, this is like elementary school, um, I would get my dolls and dress them up. Um, not in the clothes that like you can purchase at the store. I had, I would tell her, I was like, Ma, like I want this dress and I want to make it out of this fabric and together we would make it. And it was just, I don't know, it was pretty cool. Just like having that bond with her. Um, and then when I learned how to sew, I started making stuff for her. Um, but my mom being my mom, she never like, if you go to the house, you will not find what I made. She has it tucked in under the bed because she, she's afraid that it's going to get dirty or something bad's going to happen. So everything that I make her is never used. It's under the bed. That's sweet. Um, when, when did you know, you said at a young age, but when did you know, like, I really like doing this? When did that feeling come? And how did you know that this is something you wanted to pursue as you grew up? Yeah, I would, I say, I think high school, um, I, I just, I knew this is something that I really enjoyed. I knew it was something that, you know, I'm not a night owl whatsoever. I don't like staying up late. I like to sleep. Um, but when it comes to making something, I, I can just spend hours, like just hours on it. Doesn't matter what time of day it is. You know, I don't. I don't even feel like I'm hungry. Like I, someone needs to remind me to eat, just because I get so wrapped up in the work. Um, and I didn't really think you can make a profession out of it fashion design, like all the creative industries, this is something you hear about growing up. You know, when you're little, everyone's expecting you to say, you know, you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, um, any of those um, careers. And, and for me, it was like, I never heard someone say, you should be a fashion designer. Um, so it wasn't until there was actually a, a recruiter from the College of Textiles that came to my chemistry class, and he talked about uh, polymer color chemistry, talked about the, the tech side of, of the College of Textiles. Um, and in the pamphlet that he gave out, he there was actually pictures of this girl that was uh, working on a mannequin. And so I asked them, I was like, what, 
what is she majoring in? Like, what, what is she doing? And he talked about fashion textile management. And so I was like, oh, I want to do that. Like, I like to do that. I spent hours on doing that. Let me do that. In no way did I think about, oh, is this going to give me money? You know, what's the salary for this? Like, how easy is it for you to get a job? Like, the scary questions um, that come with the creative industry. I didn't think of any of that. I was just like, I like to do this. I'm going to go for it. So then I ended up studying it at NC State. That's amazing. And that's why it's it's so important to have these events where recruiters or career fairs or just people outside of the norm to come in and talk to students about different career paths. There's so many career paths, especially in America, that you can dive into and maybe unbeknownst to our immigrant parents where they, they just want you to be secure, right? They, they struggled so much that they want you to not have to worry about the things that they had to worry about. And it's respectable, but there's a whole wide plethora of jobs and careers that do pay well, um, whether they be creative or not. And I think it's it's so cool that the recruiting worked for you. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, it's doubly cool that you knew right away, like, this is what I want to do and didn't have those second doubts because that is very difficult. You know, I think a lot of immigrant students have a hobby or a passion, but they just don't know how or they just don't think they can make a living off of it. And so they decide and there's nothing wrong with having a nine to five and doing your hobby on the side. But if you can, like you're very blessed and lucky if you can merge the two together. And that's that's super, super cool. So what did it feel like when you got accepted? Um, I was extremely excited. I, I, so if you had asked me, uh, you know, you know, two years before when I was like a sophomore, I wouldn't have told you anything about college. Really, I didn't think that was something for me. I actually didn't know how that worked, um, and I was like, extra school, like who does that? Um, but you know, through some resources and opportunities that I got in high school, I learned about college and, you know, what this means. Um, and so I applied for all these schools, but the only school I wanted to go to was NC State and because of the tech slot program and because it's 45 minutes from home. So I'm far away from home, but I'm close enough where if I need dinner, I can go home and get dinner. Um, and so I remember getting that envelope that wasn't this large envelope that everyone says it was like a smaller envelope that says it was a large envelope and they get it and I was I don't know like you know people say like you know one decision doesn't change your life okay this one did um getting accepted to NC State just completely you know changed my life and you know we we kind of broke the system you know for my family and I because I'm the first one that was there I graduated and now we're here and, and we're slowly like, you know, progressing and and it's just, it's a beautiful story. Yes, it is. And um, so a couple questions. Tech, to bring it back to the tech focus that we like to do with making space, technology when it comes to textiles is really interesting because a lot of the tools um, just in this kit that we gave, the mask making kit, are super ancient, super old a needle, some thread, some cloth, and you can do a lot. Um, so what were some of the tools that you were using in high school? And then once you got to NC State and you were in the College of Textiles, what resources were available to you that you hadn't even thought about using when it came to textiles and working with cloth? Yeah, I remember in my classes in high school, you know, I was exposed to just your regular sewing machine, your serger, um, you know, nice, pair of scissors that cut through fabric, um, just kind of your, you know, standard home ec stuff. And getting to NC State, you are exposed to a lot of like the industry, like a lot of industrial machines and, you know, machines that only do one job, but like is very essential for that. You know, for example, you know, the machines that we need in order to create athletic wear you know, athletic wear is very, it can be stretchy, has a a very strong function, you know, it has to perform a certain way, especially for the athlete or for whoever's wearing it. Um, And there's a specific machine that does that. And even outside of the making stuff, you know, going a little bit a step back, creating the fabrics, you know, some people have this, you know, idea that knitting is, you know, what you see like your grandma doing or whatever, or what you're doing during Christmas when you're making those presents and it's just like a couple of needles and some fancy yarn. Not NC State, you have 
you know, a software, you create your design and then you submit that design to the knitting machine. And it's this huge machine. It's just like wrapping around creating your design. And that's, I mean, yeah, and I don't think any high school owns any of that. Um, and then you see these giant, super big printers and also creating your design on a software, creating that pattern and then submitting it to the printer. And then you see your design come alive. Um, and that's super cool. And I think it's really exciting, you know, to be an NC State student to see your work go from a sketch to something you do on the computer to a full out, like, you know, tangible object that you can actually touch and, you know, from there create, you know, the final piece. Um, and that's just my side. I mean, you know, there's other parts, other majors that get to work on, uh, I guess, I would say fancier stuff, like, you know, working with the polymers and uh, creating like artificial arteries out of non-wovens and, um, you know, creating, working with pyroman and making sure that the fabric can sustain a certain degree of fire and it's, it, it's, it's, it's a world um, and you can, it's all downstairs at the College Textiles. <laughs> I need to go take a trip because I'm not really fully aware of um, how, how expansive it is. I know that NC State is like top 10 schools for textiles um, and this must be one of the reasons why. We have a question in the chat and I do want to recommend everybody for t uh, who's tuning in, thank you for tuning in and also feel free to join the conversation. You can ask any question in the chat and we'll get to it throughout the interview. Um, again, thank you. So one of the questions is, did you use those machines a lot in your classes or was it more for like hobbies? So it varied on your classes. Um, so I was in the TAD inside, the um, textile pair. I can't remember the acronym. Um, but the design part, I guess. Um, and uh, for one of my studios, we were specific on the machines. So we learned a lot about fabric design, right? And so that's where I used the big knitting machine. I used the big woven machine. I used the printer. Um, and I'll, as you progress through you know, your years and through every studio, you had access to these machines. So if I, you know, if the assignment was to create a menswear line, I could go and purchase fabric or I can take the time and create my own fabric, produce it and then produce my clothing piece. Um, and of course, if you were interested in something, the, the professors were really cool about, you know, showing you how it worked. Um, like a lot of, some of our students went out of the way and learned how to use the laser cutter. Um, and that really helped when they created their portfolio. That wasn't something that was in any of our courses, uh, but it was available to us because we were textile students. And for those of you who are not textile students, at the library's makerspace at DH Hill, we have laser cutters, we have embroidery machines, and we might not be as in-depth as the textiles, the College of Textiles, but you can definitely get some beginning workshops. They have workshops online right now during COVID and eventually people will be able to get back in. But those tools are really, really cool and um, you have access to them through the expensive tuition that you pay. So it's really great to hear that y'all were using them for your classes. And it sounds so cool that an assignment would be create a menswear line. Like, and then I imagine they grade you on the quality and what they, they give you um, tips and tricks on how to make it better. It just seems so interesting. It's such a different world from than what I come from. I studied business management, so it was more of a lot of reports and like team building and communication. Um, it seems like you could really dive into this either with a team or by yourself in textiles. We have another question. Uh, what's your favorite textile technique? My favorite textile technique? Uh, I would say um, I, I love just like the handmaking stuff, right? Um, so something that I enjoy doing is, I don't know why this comes up to my mind, but pleating. Um, so at NC State, there's a giant pleater. So you put in your fabric and it creates the pleats for you and then you're done. But me taking a long way, I actually enjoy the process of like breaking down your fabric into the lines and figuring out how the pleats are gonna fold getting your iron and creating those crisp lines. Um, obviously, if, if I'm gonna make something that's very large, I'll probably use the, the pleater, but 
you know, if it's something more at a smaller scale, then, you know, I prefer to do it by hand. Very cool. So when you're a freshman and you're, you're brand new in the College of Textiles, you have to take your required courses, of, of course, and you're getting used to everybody, you're meeting new friends. Where do you start when it comes to textiles? What are, what are some of the, like, the 101 classes that they're teaching you? Is it history? Is it theory? Um, yeah. Yeah, they throw you right in. <laughs> um, so the first course you're taking, and it's going to be where you spend most of your time, is your first year studio. And so I think, you know, this is where you build your foundation. So they're not going to focus more on the final product. They're going to focus more on how did you get there. And so this is something that's very important um, and it kind of differentiates, you know, what is design compared to what is art is the process. Just like, you know, in science you have, you know, you have your hypothesis, you have your method, you have like a series of steps, right? When you're creating an experiment, the same thing with design, you know, you have your design process, um, you know, about your colors, your elements, um, all these principles and elements of design. And at first year studio, you really go in depth into each one. You know, there's there's a science, there's psychology behind why you do what you do. And I think in first year studio, you spend a lot of time just focusing on that and and also learning how to communicate your ideas from a sketch or you know a vision to an actual product. Um, because in the real world, you know you don't want to have to do the whole thing by yourself. This is something that you have to communicate to other people and you need to learn how is the best way to communicate those ideas to others that, you know, may not be familiar with your style or your process. Definitely. How, how important are those sketches? I've seen some legendary designers, they can't sketch for a lick and then others, they can sketch perfectly so that you can see every detail. Um, well, how do you view sketch? What's your theory on sketching? I, I wish I was good at sketching. <laughs> um, this is something that's intimidating because I think a lot of people who get into design and mostly fashion design, they're like, oh, I can't draw, I can't do it. Okay, I can't draw either. And well, thankfully uh, we have Photoshop and we have a lot of you know um, these really cool computer softwares that you can use to help you with your sketching. Um, so it is important because essentially this is what you're using as a reference point when it comes to you know creating the collection or creating any sort of product um i'm not the best at it and i'm getting better the more i practice uh but usually what i do is i try to create my idea first by you know paper and pencil and then i'll take a picture of it upload it onto photoshop um and then use what they call texture mapping to place my fabrics where I where I where I have an idea of where I want them to be, and with the fabrics that I work with, they're super colorful. So I would take a really long time to actually hand uh, draw those. So instead, is I upload that onto Photoshop, and then I I get a sample of my fabric, and I basically copy and paste it into where I want to see it, and then that's when I have the final look. And it's like, okay, this works, or this is horrible. Let's try this again. Um, so yeah. That's so cool. So don't let not being able to sketch deter you from a career in textiles because there are tools that can help you. Um, and it's all about just kind of finding, like, I guess, from what you said, what, what works for you and how you can communicate what it is you're trying to communicate. Um, that's very cool. And Photoshop, super complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but such a good tool. Once It feels so good once you get past that initial learning curve and start really, yeah. it's such a powerful tool to use. Um, so it's... it's Amazing that you get to use that in your job and in your career. We have another question in the chat. And again, I just want to encourage everybody to ask any and all questions. Um, we are here to answer the questions. Uh, so Crafty So So says, how do you get the pleats to stay in? And are some fabrics better than others? Uh, the pleats to stay in, um, what I'll do is the iron is your best friend. Like it irons out all the flaws and just makes things very crisp and like very well um, lined up. And so I'll do that and I'll also um, take it to the uh, the sewing machine and I'll do what they call as a top stitch um, just to make sure that they stay in place. Um, with the fabrics, uh, it depends. I know this is not a great answer, but it depends on what you're making. So for example, if you want something that has a very strong structure, 
then you want to you want to use a fabric that is more like crisp and um, not as drapey, if that makes any sense. Um, obviously, like if you want like a super flowy skirt, you might want to use uh, some chiffon, some silk, things that like you just pick up the fabric and there's a, a lot of movement already and you're not even doing anything else to it. Um, but if you pick up another type of fabric, like, like this guy, there's not much going on, right? But, you know, this one too, like there's not much going on, but there's other fabrics that you pick it up and it has like all these waves already. Um, so it depends on what you're trying to make will help you determine what type of fabric you should use. Gotcha. And for someone who just wants to start, they've been wanting to get into sewing, wanting to get into working with cloth and textiles, what are some of the tools that they would need just to, like, at a home studio? What are some tools that you would recommend? So you can learn a lot of things with just, like, a needle and thread, um, but it does take a lot of time. So what the machine does is it saves you time. And the machine isn't that hard to learn. Um, there's a lot of YouTube channels, uh, a lot of people out there that are willing to like break break it down for you um I would you know if you're looking for a, a machine I would get the most basic like under a hundred dollars one um you can also look on you know secondhand places like Facebook marketplace uh let go like all these places there's a lot of people trying to sell their stuff and they barely opened it or they didn't even open it and it's still in the box um that's where we got our embroidered machine um but definitely invest in a sewing machine um, and fabric. You can, you know, I know like Walmart sells fabric, Joanne sells fabric. Uh, if you look, you know, you can find fabric on the internet. Um, but I love to like touch the fabric first. So I would just go to any place, you know, around the area that has fabric or that sells fabric and then just buy whatever you see is pretty, you know, and just play with it. Um, you know, just work on creating lines first, make some pillowcases. That's how I started. Um, and then once you feel more confident in the machine, then then you wanna complicate things a little bit more and start working into to garments and you know make some pajama pants or something like that. Very cool. I've heard a lot of people around Ed the area talk about Joann's is where they get their, their crafty materials um, and they have really yeah. good sales sometimes. Um, Coupons. <laughs> So back to back to college. When do you get to pick um, your trail in in the College of Textiles? When do you get to establish this is the route I want to go? So with uh, fashion textile design, so the major that I chose, um, you have to. Well, this is when I went, um, and it was two thousand and eleven that I. I went into this into this major um you have to apply for it so from the get-go before you're even in the program they had uh you had to be interviewed by faculty and also um submit your portfolio so and the reason they do this is because it's very very niche um I think in my class there was like 20 of us and half of us were textile design, so they focus more on the fabric, and then the other half was fashion design. Um, and our studio courses were very small. And at the beginning, the first year, you're going to take classes with everybody, and then it's in the second year where it's like, okay, my friends, you know, who are in textile design are working more on creating fabrics. They're doing more focuses on print and on knitting, whereas I'm over here taking men's work classes, um, draping, pattern making, more about the construction of clothing um, and how that works. But everybody has to take all the sciences, your physics, your calculus, like that's all of us. Wow, calculus, that's tough. That's where I wouldn't have been able to make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> I don't use it, I don't know why I had to take it, but yeah, yeah they take calculus. I'm sure somebody, somebody out somewhere out there is using calculus in their textiles. We have a great question in the chat. Uh, in the media, the fashion industry is portrayed as very cutthroat. Um, I think we're getting to this part in your story where after you graduate and you go out into the industry and the question says, there's a lot of big egos. What has your experience been with folks in the industry? And they hope it hasn't been like the way the media portrays it. Um, so, oh, this is so sad. I, so when I graduated, I, I moved to New York and I had this idea about this concept, right? But 
I was way too scared to start something from scratch. And I was like, no, I, no, there's no way. So I followed and my professors told me, they're like, you know what, go get design experience, put yourself out there and see if, you know, maybe you like it and you want to stick to it. And so I go to New York um, and uh, I did work for Vera Wing briefly and it was very intimidating. It was very like, if she's walking up the stairs the same time you're crossing, you don't look at her, you don't acknowledge her, you keep looking straight as if she doesn't exist. It was definitely something like that. Um, she also had those, you know, I only like red gummy bears kind of uh, feel. Um, she once made us go uh, look for pastel color macaroons because she wanted to create a color palette and she was inspired by macaroons. So we were like exploring all throughout New York, looking for these pastel colored macarons. It was ridiculous. Um, so they do make you do like ridiculous things that you don't understand why. Um, after that job, I did one, I worked with a smaller company um, and unfortunately it was kind of a similar experience where they knew I had just graduated from college. They knew that I, I needed a job, like to be up there, I just needed something. And so uh, they um, didn't pay me what they were supposed to. They made me work overtime. Once they saw that what I was producing worked and they're like, oh, this girl's legit. Um, they started making me work overtime, but not pay my overtime. So I was going in on the weekends, staying late till like 9 p.m. in the city. And I wasn't getting compensated for any of that stuff. Um, and mind you, I was, I was living in Jersey. Uh, so I still had like a two hour commute, um, but it, 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 was, it was brutal. Um, but I think that that's the push that I needed to one, feel validated and be like, okay, I actually am pretty good at this stuff. And two, to convince me to, to, start, to start this kind of stuff. It's so fascinating. It's um, I've been told by my partner countless times that Vera Wang is top of the top, and but it's kind of interesting because it's it's about what works for you. I know when I was working um, throughout school, I worked in retail for a big company, and the way they treated their employees, it was like they they didn't care if you put in ten, twelve years. If you messed up once, you might get the chopping block, and that just seemed so messed up because people have lives sometimes. They can't dedicate that one day to, to their job, but it doesn't mean that they don't care about the company. And, you know, they had dedicated so much of their time to this place and to see them just go after one mistake was really messed up. And then I also had a similar experience with working for a family company where the brother and sister are arguing with each other daily and you're getting paid under the table. So there's nothing on, on record. And it's like trying to find that middle ground of what works for you. Some people might thrive in that super hectic environment and, and come out on top, but it's all about finding what works for you. Yeah. And when did you when did you make that decision to leave New York? And what, what came next? Yeah, so I I left in 2015 um, and then I came back 2016. So I was only up there for a year. I applaud for those that are able to stay there longer. Um, I love the city. It, was a lot of fun to, you know, it's very different from Raleigh. Um, and it's just fun to just sit there and, and watch people, like literally people from all over the world are there. Um, but I left and I came back with the intention to start this guy's set. I knew that to pursue fashion in Raleigh was gonna be very challenging just because the reality is that you don't, you don't hear a lot about, uh, you know, designer brands or brands in general working out of Raleigh. Um, a little bit in Charlotte, but not so much here. And so when I came, I took Descalza kind of as another studio project. And I reached out to my professors at the College of Textiles and I asked them, you know, what do I do first? And I have this idea, I don't know if it's gonna work. And they advised me to create a collection. So a small sample line of what Descalza would look like, take photos of it, put it on a website, and just see how people react to it. And so that's what I did. That's awesome. I'm so, it's so good to hear that you were able to contact your old professors and spark up that relation because that's what it's all about. It's not just the teacher teaching the students about creating relationships with people that are in the industry and that can point you, be mentors and point you in the right direction. Um, the chat is popping. It's a sorry that you had to go through those experiences, but it sounds like it helped make a 
uh, a decision to change your path. There is a, a question about working through COVID that we're going to get to in a second. Um, and this, I think, applies to Discalza. Do you ever print or apply patterns to your fabric? Do I ever print or apply patterns? Um, so with the fabrics, um, this is what we usually work with. They have a lot of color already. Um, and this is how the fabrics are woven. Um, so once I receive the fabrics, I don't do anything to them. Um, I just, we just create the garment. Uh, what we are working on now, um, for example, the graduation stoles I talked about earlier, we are doing some embroidery on them, but it's not on the fabric that we, uh, is what the fabric that's woven, it's on like a base solid color fabric. Um, and then we use our fabric as accents uh, to kind of just bring that up to life. Um, but yeah, I try to not touch the, the work that they've done. I just kind of keep it there. Um, if I try to change the colorways and stuff, then that, that would be speaking to the artisans before they weave the fabrics. Gotcha. And you said that the scalza had been brewing in your mind and the seed had been planted while you were in college. But can you talk a little bit about how you wanted to express yourself through the scalza and what, what it means? Yeah, so I had this idea whenever learning about textiles. Um, I did an internship in the summer of 2012, and that was the first time that I saw these fabrics. And, you know, talking about, like, you know, you know, I'm from El Salvador, but I was raised here. And being in the industry, it's, you know, predominantly white. It's predominantly focused on, like, 1%, you know, these people that can afford, like, crazy ridiculous uh, type of clothing. Um, when I went to Guatemala and I worked with the Mayan women, this is the first time that I felt connected to textiles. You know, I would see them and I saw these fabrics and I was like, wow, this is this is part of who I am. Like, this is my history. And if it wasn't for me studying textiles, I would have never really seen this. I would have never really met the artisans and, and kind of hear their story. And so that stayed in my head, right, 2012. I graduated in 2015. I started 2016. And for me, it was, it was keeping connected to my roots, right? You know, we're, we're getting older um, and I, no matter what, like I, no matter where I am in life, I always want to be connected to my roots and I always want to do things with my community. And so that was the, the personal reason as to why I started this guy's and, and what it means to me is to, to be able to, you know, empower both of the communities that I identify with um, and at the same time, you know, create things that are beautiful that for someone who's not, you know, nothing X, um, they can see it and they can they can learn about it and learn it from that person instead of from what the media portrays us to be. I think that's so great. And these textiles are are beautiful. We're gonna play around with some of them for the mask making kit. Even if you didn't get a kit, stick around. Um, it's gonna be great. And you created a video that you're gonna share with us afterwards as well. But that's that's the thing that popped out um, about your brand when I saw it for the first time online, it was the accents. And it was just like subtle nods to culture, towards heritage. Um, how did you build those relationships with the artisans in Central um, America? So uh, in Guatemala, I was um, already working with an artisan co-op. Um, and in El Salvador, uh, so my family and I, we like to visit as much as we often. Um, and so I had asked my cousin, I asked her if there was something similar to El Salvador as to what Guatemala has. And she told me it was very, very hard to find because in the war, of course, you know, if you looked, you know, indigenous, you were eliminated basically you know it was just like they were trying to suppress this part of us right and so now in said well you see very few towns that actually practice this this technique um and there's just one little place called concepcion de ataco and so my cousin took me there she took me to this little shop and you can hear the loom from the streets i go into the shop and i see don chepe who's one of our artisans um weaving and so immediately, I don't even like ask if I can talk to him. I just go to him and I go to his room and I'm just like fascinated by what he's doing. And I was like, oh my goodness, I saw this in Guatemala. Like, you know, tell me more about El Salvador. And, and you know, he tells me about how we do it. Um, 
And so that was very beautiful, like, like have that personal connection with him. Um, now as we're growing, I kind of uh, rely more on either people that are from those countries to kind of help me out and, you know, find these artists and co-ops. Um, or, you know, Google uh, is a good friend of mine. Um, and just looking for artists and co-ops that practice, you know, sustainable, um, ethical ways on, you know, taking care of the artisans and making sure they're, you know, being paid and taken care of correctly, um, but also can create these fabrics um, and ship it to me who's over here in the U.S. That's such an amazing story. And it shows the importance of keeping these traditions alive and also a lot of like the violence that can happen around these traditions when they, people, colonizers or just, you know, bad governments try to stomp them out. Um, but yeah. it shows the resilience. And it's so amazing that, you know, hundreds of years later, someone in North Carolina who immigrated from there could start a brand with it, you know? And it's, it's really just a beautiful story. When did you know that you had something special with Descalza? From, I guess, you knew from the beginning, but when did you, when did other people start to see that, that Descalza was special? It's still, um, it's still really new too, sorry. It's still a baby, <laughs> 2016, for, for like, you're just figuring things out. Yeah, I'm still there. Um, I would say um, when we launched our Kickstarter, uh, so we did this crowdfunding campaign um, and our goal was $20,000 in one month, right? And if we didn't get the $20,000, then we didn't get any money that was um, up, uh, donated. Um, and I think, you know, I remember the first few days when I had just launched the Kickstarter, my entire like Facebook feed was people sharing it. Like, this Calza, like, oh my goodness, like, you know, you have to support, this is beautiful. And uh, I, I didn't think any of this was going to happen, um, but it was just, and I didn't do any sort of paid advertising. I didn't buy an ad. I didn't, you know, boost a post or any of that stuff. Um, I just shared it with people that, you know, I know they care about me and I care about them. And, and it just, you know, people shared and it kept going and we got funded. And after we got funded, the Kickstarter closed, I kept getting emails about, I want to buy this. I want to buy the skirt. I want to buy the tie. And so that's when I saw, I was like, wow, I was like, we're done with the with the campaign, but people still want to purchase this stuff. Um, and so that's when I realized that I needed to take this guy stuff from just a project to an actual full running clothing business. Beautiful. We're having a little audio catch up. So let's take a quick pause. Okay, hopefully that cleared up any audio issues. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, let's get into this question real quick. So you were, this is in the chat, you work closely with artisans in other countries. How has COVID impacted those relationships? Yeah, we were um, hit pretty hard. Um, so you have, you know, here with COVID in the US, like every state is doing its own thing, right? So same thing internationally, every country is doing its own thing. Um, and in El Salvador and in Guatemala, um, they had very strict restrictions uh, where people weren't allowed to essentially leave their towns. And so what happened to us was, you know, I had this collection that I wanted to make um, for the winter line and have all these fabrics ready. And unfortunately, the artisans couldn't access their yarns because they had to go somewhere else. And because of COVID, the restrictions where you can't leave, basically you can't leave your house. Um, so that took a, a big pause on us. Uh, and I just had to wait it out for the artists to finally be able to move around. And when that happened, um, they were able to make everything. But then, um, you know, it's the same thing. Aside from like working with businesses like me and providing fabrics like for businesses like me, they also rely heavily on tourism. A lot of these co-ops have their own, you know, stores and they're in very touristy areas where people can come in and come out and they can buy these 
cute, you know, souvenirs that they take home. And so no one's traveling. And that was just a big hit. And so, you know, when I was talking to them, they were just like, anything can help. Like, if you want us to brainstorm ideas, like we we're more than willing to, we have time right now. And I was like, okay, I was like, let me see what I can do. Um, so, you know, we work together, we, we have created some fabrics together. Um, and then the other bump in the road was shipping. So in El Salvador, for some reason, they were only allowing people to ship documents. Anything else was put on pause unless you were some you know, special person that had to get their stuff out. So I had to wait until their post office said that it's okay for them to ship fabric. And even when that happened, the, uh, you know, um, the fee. So normally, you know, if I order about a hundred yards of fabric, I have to pay like $80 for shipping. COVID spiked that up to 300. And I'm like, that's a lot of money. Um, so uh, for Guatemala, like, you know, I had to, I had to take it and I paid the $300 for El Salvador. I was fortunate that my seamstress, um, who helps me a lot, she happened to uh, go to El Salvador for family reasons um, and was able to pick up the fabric. And so that's actually going to be brought to me tomorrow. Um, but this is just our fabrics. Um, and we're so, they're slowly like picking things up, you know, people are kind of going and visiting but not so much as you know they're usually they're used to um and you know so for us here no one's buying skirts and ties like you know a lot of our stuff is made for fresh formal wear and for special occasions and because there's no events happening we kind of had to pivot a little bit and so that's how the idea of creating these masks um uh, you know, mask for you and a mask for a farm worker. Uh, that initiative started to um, to happen in the summer, um, so that you know we could do something over here for our seamstresses. That's amazing. Um, one thing that's really interesting to me is you decided to start this company. You get funding, and your company starts off as international. You're not just doing everything in in um, state, local. You have to deal with governments, you have to deal with international shipping, a global pandemic <laughs> eventually. But what were what were some of the lessons you learned being a CEO um, that you know now that you didn't know when you first started that helped you with supply chain management, with overhead costs? Um, what were some of those lessons that you learned right away? Yeah, um, I mean, none of us saw a global pandemic happening. Um, so I, I never thought of, you know, what do we do if our artisans can't get to their yarn? Or, you know, what do we do if shipping has gone ex exponentially and I can't, I can't get, I can't physically go get my fabrics. Um, and so I've definitely, you know, have learned to just have patience, um, especially as an entrepreneur, you don't have all the answers and you probably won't. And a lot of these problems aren't based until until you, you were in front of them, right? Um, so I would have never seen any of this stuff happening. Uh, with our, you know, uh, fabric yardage, it's not at a quantity where I need to get this, um, you know, shipped in bigger places. Uh, for example, I'm blanking on the word right now, um, but it, it's able to get through the post office, uh, through their local post office and through ours. Um, when it gets bigger and I have these higher quantities, then that's something that I'm going to have to work with. And that's when I would have to hire people and be like, hey, how do I get, you know, 2000 loads of 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 this fabric? Um, so but yeah, definitely patience and having to communicate. You know, I've been I think we talked more with the artisans now than we have, um, you know, in previous years, just because of, you know, we're having these problems on our end, they're confronting these problems on their end. So it's just like, okay, how do we, we find something together? And it's, it's like, okay, if I can't get the fabrics, I can't get the fabrics. Like it's not their fault. It's not my fault. It's just, it's the state of where we are right now. We just have to be patient until things kind of go back to what we call, you know, normal. Yeah. And I want to, I want to get back to the mask making initiative that you have. We're going to be making masks in a little bit. Um, but a lot of a lot of our people, a lot of Latinx Hispanic people in North Carolina, they work um, in the agricultural industry, and it's a necessary industry. It's essential 
they had to go to work during the pandemic. Um, what was your inspiration behind switching over to making masks? So when all this happened um, in my personal life, we had, my family and I had just welcomed a new baby. So the baby came literally the day that COVID was cut, was announced a global pandemic. So I'm over here postpartum, <laughs> everyone's being quarantined. So it's like, okay, cool. You know, I don't have to feel bad for missing out on anything because I can't leave even if I wanted to. Um, and so uh, I was thinking about this idea, right? Of, of okay, we need to pivot. We need, we need to start making something again. Um, thinking about my seamstresses back in Sanford. And so everyone is telling me you should make masks. Like you should make masks. I was getting, you know, uh, messages on Instagram like, "Hey, do you guys sell masks?" Everybody was getting on the mask trend, and for me, it was like, "Okay, we can do that, but I want something else, right?" Like, like we're all here, we're all being quarantined, and we're all like trying to help each other out, right? Like we're coming together as a community. Like, what is something that we can do that's more than just here's a mask, buy it? There's something else to it, and. It was through talking to a friend of mine um, who works uh, at NC State Ex Extension and he works with farm workers um, and he does a lot of like teachings and stuff that he does a lot of um, classes for them. And I reached out to him and I was like, hey, I was like, I have this idea. You can tell me no, because I don't know what your situation is, right? For all I know, maybe the government's providing them all these masks and they're cool, right? So I asked him and I was like, hey, I was like, I thought about this idea of making these masks uh, for the salsa and for every mask that a customer would buy, another one would be donated to the farm workers that you work with. And he was like, Elizabeth, that is genius. Like, um, he's like, we are getting some, but it's not enough. Um, and also, you know, they they were getting the, um, the ones that you just throw away. So he's like, we're just creating a lot of waste with this. Like, is there something that can you know that you can make that does the job, but also we can wear multiple times? And so I was like, got it. So my seamstress and I we got to work, and um, yeah, we we put it out there. We started making the mask. Um, we've made over a thousand of each, so two two thousand masks. And in the summer, it was it was a lot. <laughs> like I was staying up trying to like put these boxes to go together. So that was a good lesson for me. It's like, wow, what happens when you get all these orders in one day? Um, my fiance was helping me, like my mother-in-law was helping me, like the whole, everybody at the house was interning for this guy to say. Um, but it was, it was a good experience. And I mean, we're, we're still selling them, so. How cool to turn, you know, a, a negative situation and do what you can to make it a brighter one. Mm -hmm. Definitely gonna check that out. Um, we're wrapping up on our time for the interview portion. Again, stick around for the workshop afterwards. I encourage anybody, if you have any lasting questions, to throw them in the chat and we'll get into it. But for now, uh, where do you see Descalza in the next five years? I know you got a lot of fun projects that you're working on now. What's, what's, what's on the horizon? Yeah, so we are expanding sort of uh, in products. So hopefully, um, we'll be working more on formal stuff and more special occasions, uh, particularly with weddings. Um, so creating bridesmaid capsules and capsules for your groomsmen. Um, that's something that I see in the future where you kind of get to design what you want um, your bridal team to wear. Uh, and then, you know, c connecting with more artists and co-ops. I would love to have Peru and um, Mexico on board um, and have some textiles from those countries um you know once the pandemic kind of eases off and we can travel leisurely again um i want to go over there and connect with the artisans um and then yeah i mean i still have other ways to to make income and so ideally i would love if this guy could hire me um that's every goal of an entrepreneur right is one day you get to pay yourself but uh you know it's slow and steady well, we wish you all the success with the Scalza. And I forgot to say, but congratulations, congratulations on the new member in your family. <laughs> uh, in the chat, we have, thank you. You're such a great, innovative, principled leader who thinks about not just yourself, but the people you work with. 
Very, very impressive. We're so proud of you to be an NC State <laughs> alumni. <laughs> Let me just shower you with all the praise, give you all the praise. Um, thank you for doing this. We're going to give you like five minutes to breathe and get some water, and then we'll go ahead and start the workshop. Let's give the chat one more minute to see if there's any last questions, but this was really great. Thank, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. All right, stick around. Um, we're gonna give Lisbeth about a five minute break and then we're gonna get started on the mask making workshop. If you have a kit, go ahead and get it out. Um, Lisbeth said that you might want to grab a pair of scissors or an iron. Some of the cuts of the cloth won't be as clean as Lisbeth's are because I am not crafty. I'm also gonna blame Lara Fontaine, my colleague who helped me put them together. Um, if they're really crooked, it's on her. And we'll see you we'll see you in five minutes. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Really appreciate it.
All right, everybody, welcome back. Now we are going to start the mask making workshop. So go ahead and grab your kit. If you don't have a kit, what, what materials are we using, Elizabeth? Um, so you will need uh, two pieces of cloth. Uh, they don't have to be different. They can be the same, but it's easier if it's different. You will need uh, two pieces of elastic. Each one's 10 inches long. I'm sorry, the, the cloth is, uh, this one's 7.5 at 7.5 inches. And this one's 9.5 by 7.5 inches. And then definitely need your your thread and your needle. Um, if you have thread that's the same color as the fabric that you're gonna use, that's perfect. I'm gonna use a different color so you guys can see my stitching. And then some optional things, but they actually help out a lot if you have them, is a little uh, safety pin, um, an iron, and some scissors. Cool. And again, if your kit is different than Elizabeth's, we're blaming Lara Fontaine for that. Again, Lara Fontaine, that's on her. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just playing. Yeah, the kits that you have will be perfect, and we're gonna make some masks. Awesome. Okay, so ideally, you want to have some sort of flat surface to work on this. Um, I'm going to hold my things up as I speak. Uh, but basically, the first thing you want to do is you want to place your small pieces of fabric on top of your large piece of fabric and you want to align it widthwise and put it in the middle so this is how it's supposed to look okay cool and i just realized that the pieces of elastic that i gave everybody are 20 inches so just go ahead and cut that in half um, i gave you the second one for extra so these are 20 inches. If we're using 10, then just cut it in perfectly in half and we'll be good to go. So yeah, and then so you want two 10 inches. Got you. So yeah. Um so once you have your fabric placed on in the middle, like this, you're going to sew right here, which is about a quarter of an inch from the edge. And the way you sew is you're gonna get your needle. And this part is a little hard sometimes, but you want to get your thread into the needle. This is always the hardest part. It's very hard. <laughs> I still struggle with this, and I've been working on it. <laughs> so, no shame. But once you have the thread in the needle, um, you want to give yourself a good amount of, of thread, but not too much because then it can it can be a little knotty, and that is a struggle. No good. Okay. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat about the mask making kit, or if you just want to ask Elizabeth anything on your mind. You can go ahead. I'm going to struggle with this for a little while. <laughs> okay, so once you have the need, the thread through the needle and you have them, you know, two pieces, you want to join them at the end and you want to create a little knot right here. So the way I create a knot is I usually wrap it around my finger, make a little circle, and then pull through those edges, those uh, ends. So... And there's my knots, really tiny. Cool. And then the tail, you want to cut off the tail. Cut off the tail of the knot. Marion is asking, should the thread, the thread should be doubled up, right? Once you get Correct. it through. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you want it to have doubled up. So. Okay. Cool. okay. So once you're needle and your thread are ready then you're ready you cut off the tail um your knot is still on there though you don't want to cut off your knot because then your your uh, sewing's gonna gonna come undone um you want to start sewing if it helps you can kind of create a line for yourself that's about a quarter of an inch 
away from um, from the edge. Um, a gorilla is good to have, but you can kind of gauge it. It's, you don't have to be specific. Um, just you don't want it too close to the edge because then it could come undone. Um, so you kind of poke your fabric like this. So I'm just gonna put my fabric here, comes to the other end, and I'm gonna bring it back to the front, okay? Like this. And then you're gonna pull your thread all the way. So this is what the front looks like. This is what the back looks like. Gotcha. And the knot should be stopping the back, or the I guess the black the black side. Yes. Gotcha. You want to be able to see the knot. And did you come up with this technique on your own, or is this the standard technique that you found out about? No, this is kind of um, just like the simplest way to 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 create it. Uh, you can find like different versions of this on YouTube. Um, mask making went really crazy last year, so. People are making masks out of like, um, like the top of your pots. What you use a pot cover, um, just a bunch of different ways. But I felt like this was the simplest, easiest. You know, working with with, with squares and rectangles. Nice. And so. Elizabeth created a really awesome video with the overhead shot. So don't worry if you fall behind. Um, we'll have that for you afterwards. Actually, I'll throw it in the chat right now. And I am not good at making videos. Um, so that was my first attempt of making one. So please excuse video professionals, TikTok professionals, please don't judge. Um, I tried. <laughs> Not to get us too sidetracked, but content is the name of the game right now. And I'm sure a lot of people would love to see you working on the fabrics that you work on. Is that something that you have in mind to, to build up the social media platforms? I do. And I do get a lot of like, hey, I'd love to see how you do things. I just, I need to be good at reminding myself to either record or to document all of that. Um, yeah, I just need to get better at it. I'm, I'm not good at doing that stuff. Um, so it's it's a note for myself. If, if somebody wants to follow me, you know, doing things, like, please <laughs> uh, help me out here. Um, it's, it's challenging to stay on top of everything and then, you know, document everything. Um, but I'm working on it. I'm sure. And if you ever want to use the digital media lab at the libraries, you have access to that space. And there's cameras and green screens and all that stuff. So we can get you situated. Thank you. OK, so you're going to keep sewing until you get to the edge, um, to the other side of the blue fabric or the, the black fabric, not the colorful one. And you want to do the ins and the outs kind of as small as possible. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by small in a little bit. Let me make some so that you can. And then how big are the stitches supposed to be? So not too big. Um, you see mine? Perfect lines. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you don't want them too big. You, the smaller, the better, actually. Um, that means that there's less space uh, for the fabrics to open um, between stitches. You want to have a small space between your stitches. So and you're just going to keep going. Marion says like half a raisin. <laughs> Sorry? Do you, she, she says like half a raisin apart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Marion has unique measurement standards. Yeah. <laughs> half a raisin is perfect. Let me see if I can move my, can you see? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so when you get to the very end, you wanna create a little knot. And there's different ways to create one. What I do is I bring my needle over like this. 
And when this circle right here intersects right here, I just put my fingernail on it and I pull the thread. Oh, do a little bit more. And there's my knot. And then you want to cut it. Don't cut the knot, just cut a little bit of the fabric, a little bit of the thread off. When you, um, with the loose piece, could you show how you did that again? Sorry? With the, with the loose piece of thread, could you show how you made that knot? Yeah, so. I ran out of thread, so I have to read. So let's say I'm at the very end. So you're going to take your thread, you're going to bring your needle around it and inside like yes. this. And then you're going to pull your thread and keep pulling. You want to stay as close to the fabric as you can, the tighter the knot, the better. And so what I'll do is, I can only get so close, right? So I'm gonna put my finger now on the knot itself and pull this. It's where my, where my needle is. I keep pulling it. And then when you're out, that's my knot. And so um, the same thing you did on one side, you're going to do it to the other side. And you'll have to do the same thing once you cut off your thread. After you've made your knot, you're going to re-knot your thread, cut the tail, and then do the same thing again. And you also want to make sure your thread is long enough to go through. If it's kind of short, you might have to re-thread your needle. And what does the board help you with the grid? Um, so the board, uh, usually when I'm doing pattern making, it helps me um, just with cutting fabric um, or cutting patterns, just making sure everything's uh, straightened up, all lined up. Um, yeah, also, uh, I'll, I do a lot of things with the X-Acto knife, so it's a good thing to, to have on the bottom um, so I won't ruin my table. And your, your line work, does that just get better the more you do it? Yes. You start to see cleaner yeah. lines, your cutting will get better, exacto knife skills will get yeah. better, just like the muscle memory. Yes, exactly. It I mean, trust me, it's hard to to sew, to cut, to even draw a straight line sometimes. Um yeah. but it does get better with um with practice. And then you have lots of tools that can also help you and just make things a little easier. And so were you hand making all the masks? 
Not this way. Um, the the way we uh, use our machine for those. Um, also, our masks, masks are three layers. Mm -hmm. So they have both, you know, the, the outside fabric, the lining, and then we have another um, more like a like a sort of like an interfacing. Um, and that just helps. It's like a non-woven fabric um, that kind of just helps with the filtering. Um, both the masks that we make for the guys and we make for the farm workers, they're both three layers. Someone in the chat said, your stitches are so even and it must take so much practice. Yes. <laughs> I take a lot of time. I still mess up, you know, like right here, I don't know where I was doing, but it works out. And do you notice like the, the mess ups um, with different apparel brands? Like, will things catch your eye where you're like, oh, I would have done that differently? Maybe not mess yeah. ups is the right word, but just things you would do differently. So the quality, uh, the quality, and this is when you, um, this is when you see like what you're paying for. Um, so a lot of, for example, you know, H&M, Zara, like if you look at the stitching, you're going to see that it's not the best of the quality. And that's because of the way that it's produced, right? They're making like bulks of this at the same time, like super fast, super quick. Um, and so they're not really taking their time. And so you see it in your stitching and then you see it whenever you try to you know, wash your clothes or whatever, and the things start to come undone and you have a lot of unthreading. Um, and that's because of how it was made. Uh, but if, you know, a company is actually like taking their time to create things, um, you will see a lot of it in the quality. Um, you just, you know, you, you, you're intuitive, right? So you can really gauge like, wow, this feels really nice. Or, you know, this looks really crisp. Like that helps you realize, okay, this is actually really good quality. Um, so yeah, so and I the, can tell like I'm not paying for that. And the good quality, while it might be more expensive, it leads to less waste. I know, what it, I don't know what they call it, but some like quick fashion or something like that, the H&M's. They, fast. because it, fast fashion, yeah. Because it, after three washes, it kind of starts to fall apart. And it ends up back at the landfill. And, you know, you're paying only $20, but it's gonna, it, it doesn't last as long. Yes, yeah, so it ends up like, okay, you're paying 20 bucks for your shirt, but how many times are you having to buy that shirt? Yeah. My dad's got a leather jacket from the '80s that he still rocks, and it's it's perfectly, it's still rocking. Yeah, that's like um, how a lot of our things that are made now, right? Like machines or cars, like how they used to be made, that lasts a lot longer than now. Like everything's made out of plastic, and you use it like a couple of times, and then you have to look for the parts. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing with with our sewing machines and with our clothes. Emily Schmidt says, um, my second line is already better than my first one. Still not perfect, but who needs perfection? Exactly. Yeah. There's room for error. Okay, so after you're done with, um, so this is what I have so far. Let me show you guys. Can you see my lines? That's where the front looks. This is, this is what the back looks. So after you're done with that, um, you've knotted your threads, you've, you've sewn your lines, um, you're gonna turn it inside out. So just like this and pull this through. So now you can't see your lines. See. Where you sewed, that becomes your new edge. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So one thing also talking about quality is uh, you don't want to see the stitching. If you can look at a piece of garment and you can't figure out how they made it, that's really good quality. You don't want to see the stitching. You want to be as seamless as you can. Um, how cool. I, I didn't know any of these little tricks of the trade. Yeah. So then um, what you'll do here is this is where I recommend to use your iron. Um, it helps you kind of crisp these lines out. Uh, I know with the fabric that we have, um, the iron is a really good friend. Um, if you don't have an iron, then if you just like press it down, 
like this a couple of times and it kind of helps. So see, you're starting to see those crisps. And this fabric starts to ravel a lot. You can see it starts to come on threading, so you have to be very careful with it. I'm going to iron this right quick. Cool. If you have any questions for Elizabeth, feel free to throw them in the chat. If you've already given up, let us know in the chat. <laughs> I have given up, um, but I'm going to go back to the YouTube video and take my time. Okay, so now they're crisp, very nice lines. Um, now what you want to do is you're going to take these new edges and you want to, this is again, the iron can help a lot, but you're basically going to fold about a quarter of the inch in and then you're going to fold it again. So then it's going to look like this and your edges are inside so that way you don't see the raveling. So fold in half and then fold again. Yes. So you fold in half kind of. Marion is saying that when she turned it inside out it looks pretty good. Yeah. And what you want to make sure is this is going to become like a little tunnel or a casing. So you want to make sure that it's wide enough to, to fit your elastic. That's our goal right now. So this is this is a good width. Gotcha. A little bit bigger than your elastic. Yeah, you want it to be a little bit bigger than your elastic. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to iron this. Um, for those who don't have one, just try to keep pressing on it until it kind of it starts to take its shape. But the goal is you want to have your, your raw edges, you want those to be inside. You don't want to see those. And you're going to do the same for both sides. And Elizabeth, when you get back, where did this fabric come from? So the one that we're playing with, um, both the one that I have and the one that you guys have, is from Guatemala. Um, and the artisan's name is uh, Juan Manuel, um, and they have a little shop in Antigua uh, called Casa de los Gigantes. So if you're ever in Guatemala, you should go to Antigua and go to Casa de los Gigantes, and you can find more things that you can make. Casa de los Gigantes? Mm -hmm. House of the Giant. House of the Giant. It really is a beautiful fabric and the color. It's like cool, cool colors, but then it has that red and yellow accent to kind of set it off a little bit. It's yeah. beautiful. This is very popular fabric. Yeah. And he wove it, um, it's, he, he weaves with his family. So his, his uh, daughter and his son and his wife all weave. That's pretty cool. A family of craftsmen. Mm -hmm. And so these textiles, they're different than the El Salvadorian ones and they're different than the Mexican textiles, even though they use similar patterns? Correct. So um, they have uh, they may have like a similar machine, like the weaving loom, but it varies with color. Um, so the different cups of color, the different types of stripes and patterns that they make. Um, you'll see some places uh, they do not the weaving loop, they do what they call the backstrap weaving. And that one is where they tie basically from their waist, they'll tie like a, like a band and then they put the needles up and then they do the other half on a, like a tree or something. So you'll see the lady, you'll see her like kneeling down with a band on her waist, the threads lined up and then the other half tied to a tree. And she's just like going back and forth. Um, 
and uh, the patterns that she makes are usually specific towards her, her region. So back in the day, you can tell where someone was from based on the patterns that they had in their garments. It's very cool. Very cool. And again, such a, an amazing tradition, probably that hundreds and hundreds of years to figure out the, how to put these looms together is amazing. Yeah, and they still do, which is, I think, super, super fun that, you know, people are still, uh, in Guatemala in particular, you can go to places like Panajachel and you see the women, like they're still wearing their, their traditional garments and it's really cool. And you'll see them with their traditional garments and then like a really nice phone. Um, so just the mix of the two worlds. Yeah. So now my, this is what happens after I iron them. And what you're going to do is you're going to sew the same way you did the first type of sewing, but now you want to do it like about an eighth away from the edge, but not, it'll be this edge, the one that's touching the, the blue part. So you're going to sew, I'll show you. Cool. Yeah, the traditional style is very interesting from Mexico all the way down to South America. I know in Colombia, the traditional women, usually older women, they'll wear like bowler hats with mm. dresses with flowers. And that's like a specific style, I think specific mm. to like the mountainous regions. In Peru, they have the beautiful colored beanies because it's very cold in the high, high areas, like in the Andes. And so they, they have their own style. Um, I always love a good uh, Mexican blanket from like the flea market with the textiles that you can put out for a picnic or whatever. And this is my the first time seeing a fabric this thin, but so woven, like woven so intricately. Yeah, and they take it, it's a whole process of like just um, preparing your yarn, uh, you know, preparing the machine and then actually weaving it. Um, you know. It's, it definitely takes a lot of time and and that's why like you know with us like because of how delicate these fabrics are um when you order something from us uh it's not something that i carry like i don't have some sort of storage place where i can just go pick it up uh we make it after um so that one you know we know that everything we're making has a home and then two it helps with fit so if you want to like customize your skirt we can do that for you because whether you want to or not, like we're making the skirt after you order it. Um, so it, it gives us a better chance of making sure that what you what we make for you is going to fit you. Very cool. We have a question from Sonia. For this fabric, what is the best way to keep it looking great? Hand wash only question mark? <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Um, hand washing, spot cleaning. The cool thing about this fabric is that because it's so colorful, if you like accidentally stain it, uh, the stain isn't that visible. Um, but if you must, must clean it, uh, must, must wash it, then uh, hand wash it and then air dry it. Um, those are the, the, the safest way um, because of the delicacy of the fabric. Do you recommend okay. that for your clothing as well? Yeah, I would, you're not, so depending on the clothing, um, you're not really supposed to like wash it after every use. For example, like your jeans, like they can have a little bit more of a longer life. Um, but obviously like your intimate clothing, like that's something you have to wash every day or after every use. Um, but a lot of things you can spot clean them. Um, and then, you know, you could, if you need to, you can take it to the machine and put it in like the delicate cycle. Um, but yeah, but you have to, to take care of your clothes like they take care of you. I like that. This is what I have so far, what I meant by like being close to the edge, but not too close. This is what it looks like on the... So if you have a thread that matches your fabric, then our the goal would be not to have these lines for you to see that. Unless it's a design feature, unless I'm doing it on purpose. Um, but in my case, I'm doing it for you guys, but I would have just used like a 
this color blue thread. Gotcha. And, um, but it's okay. You can say it's it's part of it's part of the design. Yeah, I think if you had a color that bounced off of it, all of these colors, maybe like a bright neon color, it would kind of mm -hmm. act like an accent. Yeah. So as you do that, and I'm gonna make you multitask. Who are some of the designers that you look up to that their quality of work you admire? So uh, there's one in particular, um, her name is uh, Carla Fernandez, and she is a Mexican designer um, who also works with artisans. Um, she's also all about the handmade process. Uh, she's about the square root process, which I don't know very much about, but it's basically a way that you cut the fabric in where you create no waste. So all the clothing pieces that she she makes, she cuts the fabric in a way that no waste is produced and all the fabric is used. Um, and it's really cool. Her stuff's been worn at the Oscars. Like I just admire, you know, not only you know her craft but also her approach on um, working with the artisans. She's never portrayed them to be, you know, these, you know, humbling. Um, you know, young and naive people who, who need our help. She's always put them on, on a spotlight where, you know, they're fearless and they're strong um, and they're, you know, uh, pioneers and, and you know, brave and just all this good stuff, right? And I just, I think, you know, representation matters and how you tell the story is very important. And so I, I really admire how she presents the artisans to, um, in her brand. Um, so yeah, she's she's a big one. You guys should look her up. It's hard yeah. enough to make great work and great craftsmanship, craftsmanship, and then to do that with no waste is is doubly incredible. That's amazing. It's really hard, yeah. It's especially in the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. We're the second biggest polluter. So the first polluter is oil, and then fashion is right behind it. It's really sad. Um, but I think our generations are really looking at that and being like, you know what, there's ways you can make beautiful things and you don't have to like hurt the environment. So Carla is a big one. There's others, um, you know, Eileen Fisher, she's also really big on sustainability. So there's a way to do it. Just, I think the industry has been stuck in the 1920s for such a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and what was her name again? Carla? Carla Fernandez with a Z at the end. Gotcha. So I moved on to the second, the other, the other side. Can you hold it up real quick? Yes. So I finished this side. You see how now my, my edge doesn't come off. So now I'm doing this side. Nice. So same thing. Yeah. And you actually, after you're done with this stitch, you're almost done. It's like 80%. And we're done. So, very quick and easy. I wish we could share pictures in the chat. I don't think that's a function, but maybe we'll throw in the Zoom link for the last 10 minutes and everybody can, can show the mask that they're making. Yeah. I feel like right now it's just me in the studio, just working alone. But I know you guys are out there. They're out there. <laughs> <laughs> because you focus on detail, I imagine. What, uh, so let me rephrase this question. Um, I've heard that one of the hard things business-wise with owning an apparel company is there's so many different sizes and everybody has a different fit. You know, you can never get it perfect. For me personally, I wish there was a t-shirt that was in between a medium and a large because that would be like the perfect fit for me. Um, mm -hmm. So do you keep your inventory low and kind of do like made to order? Or how do you find that balance? Yeah, so... Um there's this thing called vanity sizing and it's the reason why you can go to a different store and you're a different size in each store, right? It's not you, it's them. And 
it's because everyone creates their own sizing chart, basically. So if I say something's a medium, someone else may say it's a small. Um, so what we do is we do have a sizing chart, um, and I try to make it as exclusive as possible, uh, meaning that I show a variety of sizes um, and, you know, um, a variety of sizes, but also give you the opportunity to customize. So if you want a size that's already preset, um, you know, you just, you get that size, we make it according to those measurements we already have, and then you receive your order in the mail. Or you can customize, which is you tell me your size, you give me whatever measurements I require, and it shows on the, on the product page. Um, you give me those measurements, and then we make it according to what you send us, and then you, we ship it out. So in the end, like, we're still making something for you from scratch when you order it. Um, so you have the flexibility of uh, customizing it and it it's it's still not perfect, right? You know, if, if the customer didn't, you know, measure themselves well and it's off, like it's still not perfect, but it helps us get closer, right? Like, so that's why, you know, it's important for me, for people to kind of like just learn how to take your own measurements, you know, because those are things that are important for you to know, because those are the true numbers, not two, four, six, eight. It's what is your waist size? What is, you know, your hip size? Like all of that stuff. Um, I know now in the industry and like uh, younger brands, what they're doing is uh, they're basically finding ways where you kind of take a picture of yourself and it gives you your measurements. This, like, you know, it's an app or some sort of software. In textiles, we had a body scanner that you honestly, you know, you got in your undergarments, you went in, you stood still for like a few seconds, and then after you came out and you had a list of all these specific measurements, like, you know, your neck size or the size of like, you know, the your hairline to like where your eyebrows are. Um, so now the industry is trying to do something, some version of it where the customer takes a picture of themselves and then it scans out these measurements that they need to make the garment. Um, I can't afford that, so I, I ask, you know, I go old school and just get people to get a tape measure and a friend and measure themselves. How cool! It seems that's it seems like that's where I would be headed in the next ten years, um, once things get a little bit cheaper. Marion in the yeah. chat says that they, she really appreciates that there are different body shapes shown on the Viscalza website and on social media. Yes, yeah. yeah. That's really important for me is, I mean, we come in different shapes and colors. So it's important for me, like, that needs to be there, you know? Definitely. All right. So I finished sewing my edges in. So you see. So if you're with me and you're in this step, you're done sewing. Like, that's it. So you can put your needle in your thread away. And if you're not with me, you're almost there. So the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take your elastic, make sure it's 10 inches long. And this is something that after we make it, if the mask fits a little too tight around the ears, um, you can always, you can buy this elastic at Joann's. I think Walmart sells it to any sort of craft store. Um, you can purchase more of it and just make the, the length longer. Um, and that'll help with, with the ears. Um, there's also different types of elastic that they're now selling. That's a lot more comfortable to wear um, since, you know, we started wearing these masks. But basically what you're going to do, you're going to take your safety pin, if you have it, and you're going to bring it in and put it on your elastic. Okay, and then, so remember you made, you actually were making a little tunnel slash casing. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna put your pin along with your elastic into the tunnel. And it's gonna be a little rough to start first. Okay. And then you're going to just keep, you're going to feel the 
hit the safety pin and you're going to keep pulling it to the other end. If you don't have a pin, then try to feel out the elastic. Um, that might take a little longer, but it will be there. So I'm going to keep going. One thing is you want to make sure this doesn't, the tail of this doesn't go all the way in to the, to the casing or you're going to have to go back. So it's here. So now once you come to the other side, um, you want to take your pin off. And what you're going to do is you're going to join your edges together, your ends together. Make sure they're laying flat. They're not like twisty or anything. You want them to be flat. And you take your ends and you're going to kind of give it a little bit of a stretch. You're going to put it around your finger and you're going to create a knot. Just like the knot that you made with the uh, thread, the same thing you're going to do with your elastic. It's going to be a little challenging at first, so you got to get it good. Make sure it pulls in and then pull. Give it a tug. Okay, and we'll come back to this. You can take the ends off if you want. I just see them alone. And I'm gonna do the same thing to the other side. Cool. Even your knots look good. <laughs> take practice. I still struggle in. Um, I make silly mistakes, like, especially when I'm really tired. There's been times where I'm working on something on the sewing machine, and the way the machine works is you need thread in the top and you need thread in the bottom. Um, and I can go sewing, you know, uh, a whole line, and then I don't realize until I'm done that there was never any thread in the bottom. So I have to redo it again. Yep, I can see that happening. Yeah. It happens. I imagine, like with old piano players, you can see like all those small muscles in their fingers, and the tendons are all really pronounced and strong. And they can you tell with like old seamstresses as well that like they just have more muscles in their in their hands than normal people? Yeah, I, I see it in my mom's hands. Mm. Like just because of so many years that she's done of like sewing and like you know the ends of her thumb right here they're super prickly because of her just the needle always running into it. Um, but I see it, you know, they're, they're hardworking hands, yeah. um, so they got the little roughness to them. Callus. Work calluses. That's calluses, yeah. yeah. Strong hands. Yep. Yeah, I can never be a hand model. <laughs> All right, so when you've done this, you're basically done. Um, now if you want to make it a little bit prettier, what we're going to do is we're going to tuck these, the, the, the knot into the casing. So you're going to do some tugging. Um, so I'm just going to pull on the elastic until my knot is inside and I can't see it anymore. Very cool. So see? You can't see it. I'm gonna do it the same on the other side. Whenever you see shows or movies about the industry, it always seems like there's a deadline. And even if it's Louis, Gucci, um, they always are running up against the deadline. Why is that? I mean, obviously these things take a lot of time, so I can see that. But they have the best seamstresses, the best materials. Yet day of the show, it's it's like last <laughs> last things are being put together and things are being burnt. Um. Um. Yeah, that happens to me, and I'm a big planner. I'm, I don't like to procrastinate. I get a lot of anxiety from that. Um. I would say, uh, for me personally, as a designer, I feel that things are never perfect. There's always a couple things I can tweak. There's always something I can add more or take away. I could redo something. So the same thing happens um, with these name brands is that 
it's not that they're waiting to the last minute to do something. It's more of they're using every second that they have to make sure that it's perfect. Even a designer can look, it could be a week left until they have a fashion show and the designer can look at the entire collection. It's crisp, it's beautiful, it fits on the models and they can change their mind and say, no, I don't like it. Let's redo this. Let's take off the hem. Let's take off the jacket. Let's add her skirt. And I mean, if you work for them, you, you got to do what, you, what they tell you, right? So that happened a lot at Vera Wang because I got really close to the seamstresses. Um, they spoke Spanish. And so, I, you know, they would tell me like, yeah, sometimes, especially in the in February and in September when Fashion Week is going on in New York, um, they have to put in a lot of hours because more than likely almost every season um, she would change her mind and they would have to come back and just work on that piece until it was perfect and she approved it. So, yeah, that, that's real. <laughs> that is that's, very real. That's, I guess that adds to the genius of some of these folks is that always constantly thinking brain of what can I do to get better and better to try yeah. to reach that feeling of accomplishment. Um, exactly. Marion is asking, can you show how you made that elastic knot again, maybe with a different piece? Yeah. Um, so let me, let me get some more So very similar to how you did the the knot for your for your thread. You want to take both ends. You're going to put them together, right? So pretend that my 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 fabric is here. And then what I do is I kind of stretch it. I wrap it around my finger. And then I kind of grab the elastic off my finger and it's it's hard. So I it might take you multiple times to try this. Um but you create this little hole and then you tug in and then you, you create, that's how your knot is made. So I hope that helped. Awesome. Can we see your, your mask? Yeah. So this is what it looks like. Um, so if it's too tight around the, the ears, um, you just make your elastic a little longer should help. For and some you, reason. Sh you should have an extra piece of elastic in your kit. Just in case. Yeah. <laughs> and that will help. So it's getting stuck on my earring. It's not earring friendly. It looks so good. And then you're just gonna kind of tug it in. Um, it covers everything. That's awesome. So this is your mask? We're giving you a virtual round of applause. It looks great. It looks so good.